Ultra has been building for a long time and we've accomplished a lot. We've launched multiple blockchain networks, countless test nets, one awesome mainnet that have innovative new features that we think will allow mainstream gaming audiences to take advantage of all the best stuff that blockchains have to offer without the pitfalls inherent in them. But sometimes when building hard things, internal progress and public expectations don't really match up. Today, I wanted to have a frank talk with Ultra's execs, David and Nicholas, about why timelines slip during software projects and about how they view our progress. Let's get to it. So we were talking about, you know, what are the reason why um, Ultra takes so much time to develop um, its tech and I think one of the really important thing to understand is that we're building our own NFT standard. Um, and, you know, typically some people make an NFT standard and then everybody else uses it. Um, and in our case, we make the blockchain, we make the NFT standard and then we use it as well. Um, and so when you make a NFT standard, like the one we're building, which is much more complex and advanced than what is out there. Um, it takes it takes a lot of time. There's basically um, a lot of things unknowns when you build the NFT standard, and there's a series of requirements. Um, you want it to be easy to um, develop for you know easy to be used by developers. You want a good user experience. Um, and you also want to have a strong NFT standard. Um, and also you want the solution, ideally, because it's blockchain technology, you want this solution to solve um, issues um, that typically arise um, around trust issues. Um, and so when you combine all of them, you know, it is a really complicated task because you know you're building something and um you realize maybe one of the four points that i mentioned are not ideal um and because we we're, we're thinking of our nft standard as a very very long term game um as something that um ultra will heavily rely on we we're and because we want it to be a standard we don't have the luxury to say, hey, you know, we're going to do that. And then later we're going to change it because then really what happens is you end up with two standards um, or three or four or ten. Um, and so it does, you know, it is difficult because you build something and then maybe you realize, oh, you know, actually it's, you know, there's a lot of work for a developer to implement this. And it can be easier if, you know, we change this or that, the method of imp implementation. Um, or maybe you realize, well, you know, there's a user experience issue where, okay, the user will need to pay for something in the process. Um, and um, this is going to be problematic in some situation. And, you know, Ultra has free transaction. So in many places, we kind of want to keep, you know, everything to be free as, as much as possible. And so there's, you know, some, you know, different data structure and thing that or we need to do. Um, or, and then there, there's also around the trust. Um, the trust actually issue is actually um, not causing us to have to change the code, but actually um, causes us to have to develop much more. So, for example, if you have... Um, a NFT marketplace where you need to give your NFT to somebody in order for that person to sell it um, on their own marketplace, um, you're going to have to trust that person. And there's a way where we actually have this functionality in the standard. Therefore, you don't need to trust anybody. You just need to trust the protocol. And so, but that means that, okay, now we need like the, the, sales of these nfts on our back and and again like with ultra's philosophy we want it to be done correctly 
Um, like we want to be able to price stuff, for example, in dollars, even if, you know, you pay with US and therefore, okay, it needs to be linked with, you know, the, the Oracle and, you know, it goes on and on. Okay. You want to do the auctions? Well, again, we don't want to trust uh, external pe person. We want you to be able to be completely safe and put your NFT on auction. Okay. Well, now we need to build it as ourselves again. And so that's kind of like how, you know, um, the nft standard just by itself and that's not even counting everything that we do for ultra games and so on um basically balloons into something that requires us a lot of work and a lot of focus but this is for the better good at, at the end we will have a strong standard with a lot of functionalities that people can rely on and that is easy to implement and that is easy to use um, and so I, th I think um, I, I think it's important to understand that we we do this really for the better good of the ecosystem. In terms of the NFT standard as well, the criticality that you can see it arising right now in Ethereum, uh, like I was having a discussion earlier today about soul bond token, which is non tradable token, right? Uh, that's what it is. Um, yeah, make a new standard. <laughs> Yay. Uh, and so here the reality is with Ultra, first you can uh, upgrade the standard, which means backward compatibility, whatever you were doing before. Uh, and that's not, I would say, a small feat to be able to do that. Yes. Um, but there are lots of things that has been thought of that we can just see pop out, you know, different projects, different blockchain, and it's already part of the standard, uh, amongst other things. So the way it's been designed is so taking into consideration a lot of use cases that we have, and our partners have. Uh, which means very often when we work with partners, they're like, oh, by the way, we would need that. And they're like, that's right. Actually, this could be super helpful. So sometimes we're like, yep, you should really add that because it has a lot of value for the entire um, world in a sense, not only just us, uh, but for any partners or any users. Uh, at the end of the day, that's adding functionalities. Um, obviously, we won't wait to have all the functionalities perfect before releasing. The NFT standard is bound to arrive so the so the reality is here we're going to have something already super useful and we created the suite of tools and applications around it so people can first use the standard know how to do it uh, how to use the blockchain how to use the wallet so they, they need a whole set of functionalities not just one part uh, plus examples so we also work you know uh, on multiple uh, projects as part of ultra like the marketplace ultra games the wallet, tournament platform, and so on. Uh, and all of those are using at, at their core technology. So which means for others to build after, they're like, okay, that's how it's done. Let's make some, let's reuse these kind of pieces. So they do it. Okay, that's how I should do it as well. So that also drives, um, that helps a lot of developers when they want to use our technology. Yeah, I, I think um, like, it's a, it's also really in, in interesting what you said, you know, with the different use cases, because typically um, a good standard of whatever it is, um, is capable of doing a lot of different things. And, you know, typically it's, it's a, you know, um, commonly accepted that if your standard can do three or four different uh, very different use cases it's a good standard like it's flexible enough and so on and um when you look our use cases <coughs> sorry um even internally in ultra like we have the games we have um virtual items collectibles um the tournament platform all kinds of different apps um we we're implementing and we're consuming the standard ourselves, which allow us to kind of like realize, okay, we need to change that thing. We need to change that thing. And then uh, just like Nicholas mentioned, we we have um, spent a lot of time structuring um, a method for allowing us to update functionality in the NFT standard um, so that when we add new functionality that it's backwards compatible with the other standard and that developers only really need to implement one standard. Um, and then with one standard they implement in their app, they're going to be compatible with every single NFT that has been made on Ultra in the past. And that's a massive, massive difference than what exists out there. And, and just to plan and, and 
to structure and make this possible. That's a ton of work. And in the meantime, it's a moving target because like Nicholas mentioned, you know, there are new requirements that come in. Like we understand, okay, actually we, we're gonna need to do that and so on. And so um, the whole system needs to be flexible um, to be able to, um, um, you know, take in account potential future updates. I think this is actually like a really interesting way to open up the show because we've been talking maybe about 10 minutes now about what really the cost of innovation actually is. Because like what we're really talking about here is how uh, new and how difficult and how innovative the software that Ultra has been working on for years already actually is. And when you talk about um, how do you how do you maintain backwards compatibility? How do you do uh, totally new types of integrations? Um, how do you test software like in a live environment? Like that's all stuff that we've been dealing with quietly uh, on our own, and now we've been kind of involving external entities through some of the developers that we've been working with. And that process is something that I think the community themselves they're not. They're not exposed to it. Of course, they're not exposed to it, but we're exposed to it. And we understand a lot of the uh, difficulty and the complexity that's involved. Um, do you think it's fair to say that Ultra has had a hard time bringing it, its vision to the market? I think in terms of vision, so the, I don't know if it's the market yet to the community. I think the community starts to really understand, okay, how wide is the scope? And the vision of ultra it doesn't encompass yet everything uh, so even not everything has been explained today uh, but it's already like a good vision uh, so often when you see people talking about another project okay how does it compete with ultra um, it's competing with a subset of something that ultra is doing that's usually the answer um, so i think the community start to grasp uh, this whole id now in terms of markets not yet because we haven't we don't really have you know a fully live product which is I mean, the wallet is a live product, but isn't bringing a lot of value outside of storing coins and transferring coins. Um, but the goal here is with the new product, we will be able then to start uh, showing to the entire market difference. Uh, you know, already the fact of having a cohesive ecosystem, uh, so marketplace plus ultra games plus wallet plus tournament plus live stream, uh, it's already it doesn't exist anywhere else. So in terms of vision, we will already be able to show that. Uh, but obviously, we today we can't do that. Uh, but very soon we will be. So that's really great since both the marketplace and Ultra Games are to be released this year. So we have enough to show uh, this difference on the market. I don't think that people really understand like what it is that we've built, because when when you say like a marketplace, that's something which exists. I think in we can probably call it dozens of permutations across, you know, like all of the blockchain ecosystem. But what Ultra has built is not that. It's not something that already exists on the current ecosystem in the form that people traditionally would expect because of the way that it's deeply integrated with the NFT standard. Like some of the stuff that David was talking about, you know, like five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, um, without really understanding how we implemented the NFT standard itself, uh, it's not apparent in how different what we built actually is. Um, maybe, maybe we talk quickly about uh, delays because I think that that's something that um, we've been very quiet and very hesitant about speaking about. Like, I don't think that we've ever actually said the word delay. Um, is ultra delayed? And if so, why do timelines slip? In, in a sense, publicly, so it can be called a delay. Uh, internally, we don't call that delays. It's really trade-offs. So what's happening is that we don't do something, but we do something else instead. Um, and sometimes we add on top. And so this is like improving whatever we were, we were working on. So delaying is more like tied to a launch date. So if we say, okay, that day we launch something, we did it, that's totally fair. Uh, but internally, it's really things we shuffle around or improve. Um, but that's really what's happening and the goal to achieve the grander vision. If we had something very narrow, uh, like we only do like a game, for example, I mean, still a lot of work, trust me. <laughs> uh, but 
it is it is very different because we have a lot of uh, moving pieces and new pieces to the pu puzzle that are added over time um and that there's always some unknown that slow down the progress uh, sometimes we need to adapt to market sometimes we have um tech stack improvement uh, we want to make because we want to add some new functionalities that require us those uh new refactoring uh sometimes we have inclusion of a partner requires a new new feature so there are lots of things that cause uh what is publicly uh visible is delay but internally is we improving uh, whatever we are working on so instead of going with a version of the platform a we go with a a plus b c d e f around it uh, which we feel is much more valuable to get the grand vision uh, so yeah publicly yes internally trade-offs but totally fair question but but again that that kind of like goes back into um like what we were speaking about just a minute ago where like we keep building right like we have uh, built the marketplace, for example, and we consumed our own technology to be able to achieve that. And while we were consuming it, there were things that we saw that we thought would uh, impact external developers that we said, hey, listen, like we need to stop and reevaluate and say, maybe this needs to be fixed. Maybe this needs to be documented better. Maybe we need ex examples of how to do this. Like there's this process that like is very opaque externally, but very uh, apparent internally that we're on a path of improvement to make sure that when external developers end up touching this software, it's like enterprise grade, it's excellent class software, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and you touched the point with documentation. Um, you know, it's that's also a massive piece. Like, um, you know, there's so many things that we developed in ultra and we actually need to describe them and so you know you're taking away time from developers when they need to you know write this documentation and because everything is pretty much made from scratch you need to explain everything from scratch um including you know um you know the blockchain core concepts you know how we achieve free transactions how how do you mint nfts what is you know every single field in it what is the philosophy and, and so on this takes also tons of time um uh, and you know you add that up this plus that plus that plus that plus that and you end up um with a ton of work that you know potentially can be delayed because also the more pieces you have, the more risk one thing somewhere has a problem, which can cause a delay, um, you know, in the eyes of, uh, of people. And then um, you also have the whole dependency aspect because, you know, maybe one piece is ready, but, you know, like we can't release this unless we have the documentation or we're missing a tool that, we have internally the but you know that is integrated in our tech stack but that third parties developer will need to develop themselves and so we're like okay we need to have a way to provide that to them so there's always new things that would be really hard to plan in advance um and that you know add again development time additional work um and so it's kind of like you know we're we're you know what we're doing is we're tra trailblazers like our tech is very very different there's no example out there we're discovering really um things as we go um in many different um you know aspects and so this has a cost um and the main cost is really uncertainty um while while you going forward and with our goal of building really the Ferrari of blockchain and NFT technology, you are doing really research and development. And there's a lot of research involved. Um, and while you're doing this research um, and you're implementing, you can figure out, oh, there's a better way of doing that. And in many places, um, other developers would just say, well, that's OK, we can just deal with it. But um, in many cases, we decide, no, actually, this is really a substantial improvement. Therefore, we want it. And then when you do this one change on the protocol, boom, then you have 
a backend modification, data structure modification, the standard change, the documentation needs to be updated. So it's kind of like one you know thing can have a lot of impact behind, but that's um, because we want to do the things the right way. We understand very well what NFT standard means. Um, and it means like, it's something that needs to be, um, that need to have a broad utility. Um, and it's something that you want people to be able to rely on. Like there's a single standard, but the good news is like, we're getting there. Um, and the more we integrate this in our own product, the more we realize, well, this is actually really cool. Can, can we talk about content and how it plays a role in slipped timelines? In terms of content, I would say the um, scheduling. So it's one part of the equation. Um, once the product is live, it's a different story. Because um, here, for example, when you want to launch a marketplace, uh, that's that's what's coming next. Uh, so when you want to launch a marketplace, you need to schedule properly all the content in a timely fashion. So there's a stream of content uh, available. Uh, and that's not easy because you need to have the right people who want to put their content, the right timing for them, uh, that they deliver on time. Uh, so the right simple. features also. Yep. Exactly. Some so of these similar. NFT require some functionality and some other require other type of functionality. And uh, yeah, and, and because we can upgrade our NFT standard, we can start and say, well, we will start with these ones, uh, which can rely on the current version of uh, the current, you know, feature set of the NFT standard. And then this other type of NFT use cases, we, we will do them later like at that time when we will have this functionality. And then, um, so there's a lot of scheduling and, you know, in the sequence that needs to fit um, also what we're developing. Yeah, because it's a bit different when you have a live. So if the marketplace is live, there's already quite some content as part of it. So the users, they can still go there, sell their NFTs, buy other NFTs, have some new NFTs every now and then. So it's not tied to this strict timeline. Uh, it's, it's already live, so it's much easier after. Uh, in terms of uh, functionality, as David mentioned, there is also some some functionalities we add when we create. So there is two ways to get content. One is people put their content. One is you work on creating content. So we have a bunch of, a bit of both. Um, and in terms of content creation, it also allows us to define um, how we use, what functionalities we do, what utilities we give. Uh, it does also serve as a stepping stone for the other creators to be like, oh, wow, cool, that's that's a cool idea. It's a cool way to, to do the NFTs, a cool utilities. I'm going to do that as well for my collection. So part of um, content acquisition is content creation, uh, which initially we do um, with partners or directly with other companies. Uh, but in the future, we don't have to do that. But it's really the same way when we, when you build, when you use our blockchain technology, we first build the application, the first one, and people create their own. Same way for the content. We also have some people directly have content, obviously, but also us can show the direction on how it can be really used, what cool stuff we can do with it, uh, like the redeemable codes for the NFTs. Okay, how does that work? You know, many things we can do that serve as example after for the future content creators. I, I realize that what I'm going to ask uh, is a question that normally a CEO would have to answer in the positive, because like, of course you do. But I'd really like to push for an authentic answer here. Um, how do you feel about the progress of the Ultra project? Are we on track? If you're on track, um, I would say we have a bit of delay on what was expected. Um, some things were more complicated than we anticipated. Good thing is that no stone or left unturned in a sense that everything we found we fixed and it works uh, so that's really what's what is very important to us that we don't end up in a, in a direction where oh whatever we did before blocked us for this use case and that's all we can do about it uh, we have to refactor everything which is everything uh, it's not the case uh, so for us yes there is some we would want to be already like live with the with the product but since we realize over time, oh, sometimes we need to do this before or that before, it has some level of um, of, of delay. 
but at the same time, we have a more robust product than we anticipated as well. So there are some things that we didn't thought of, like, well, no, that's really cool. <laughs> we can do that now. Uh, and I think that's really good for the future as well, um, because whatever we will be adding can take advantage and benefit from these uh, functionalities. So th there are things that are faster than anticipated. Like, for example, the tournament platform wasn't planned to be arriving uh, this soon. Uh, it will. So that's, uh, that's great. Um, at the same time, Ultra Games is further down the line that was anticipated. So we have sort of uh, a mix. But at the end of the day, yes, we have more rig than anticipated. Well, we have more functionality also, right? Yeah, I, th I think exactly. the, 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 the thing that's super important um, to keep in mind is that the vision um, is absolutely on track. Um, everything that we wanted to do um, we're doing it and also in actually improved over time. There's a lot of very cool stuff um, that improved over the original uh, vision. And so it's really um, it's really a matter for us, you know, to release it when it's really ready, because also because of these NFTs and so on, if we release it too early, we're going to cause a lot of technology um, debt um which will slow us down on the next step so it's kind of like yeah we can release now but then everything that's going to be created is going to create us a lot of you know trouble for a period of time and then eventually this will be solved but while we're solving these you know we we're not going to be able to develop you know proper content while uh, as opposed to you know, doing the thing properly and then releasing, and then we can continue to develop, you know, really the real important stuff um, and improve the, the platform as at a, a really fast pace. And this is kind of like what's going to happen because, you know, there are many pieces that are really kind of like, you can see them like toolboxes that are, that we built and that are gonna be laying there for us for third-party developers and when we release the platform and these toolboxes a lot of them typically don't exist when you release the platform and therefore when when it's live you know and you want to do something then you're going to have to build it and here we're just going to say hey you know you can use that feature um and so when basically once it's live a lot of things will happen in a short time um, because, you know, the infrastructure has been well thought of and the functionality has been really made for facilitating the development and so on. So I think we will see a lot of dApps, um, quality dApps that really can leverage our blockchain and NFT technology. Um, and we're going to see a lot of um, traditional applications that will start integrating blockchain technology because they will be able to do it without creating a, ne a negative user experience impact to their user base. So there's going to be a lot of you know things that are going to happen very fast uh, following the you know release of our development kits and so on. Yeah, the the reality as well is that the dApps created will have a competitive, a serious competitive edge against similar apps uh, existing on the market because they have the tech stack that we provide to them, like. If you just take the example of the, the DEX, uh, if you have a DEX on Ultra, which is zero transaction fee, if you go on another chain when you have transaction fee, which one is better for the users? Obviously, the one that doesn't cost any transaction fee, for example. Uh, that's that's one way to see it, or the, the speed of transaction. If you have an app where you need to wait a few, I don't know, 15 seconds or 30 seconds or one minute to get your item when you're in the game, obviously, it's much worse so where the users will go where it's the experience much better so that's also one vector of serious growth for us is the quality of the depths that people can make 